Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of The Music Den. I'm your host, Armando Venditti, hoping you guys are having a fantastic day and that you're looking after yourselves and one another. In this episode of The Music Den, I'm going to be doing another installment of Album Spotlight. Now, this is a complete 180 turn from the episode I did yesterday on Caligula's Horse. This is from an artist uh, that, upon doing the research for this segment, I was surprised that this was only his second solo release. Um, but considering the amount of work that he did with his band in the 70s through to the mid-80s, I'm not surprised after all. Because as most bands do, when a band starts up, most of their energy is put into the band that they're in, getting the band off the ground, getting the band established as a viable recording and successful act. This album has uh, endeared some people to this artist. This album has alienated some people uh, from this artist. The artist is Freddie Mercury, and the album is a duet album he did with opera superstar Montserrat Caballé called Barcelona. Now, just a bit of background. Barcelona was released on the 10th of October, 1988, through Polydor in the UK and in Europe. It was not released until, I believe, around the mid-90s through Hollywood Records in North America. I myself only found out about this album after watching the Freddie Mercury tribute concert back on April 20th, 1992. And I called my local record store, which was HMV at the time, and they had it in stock. And I had it delivered to me. I was very excited to get this album. I wasn't sure what I was going to get. And to be honest with you, it took some time for it to grow on me. But once it did, it did. So uh, a little bit more about this album. Again, uh, the album was produced by Freddie Mercury, Mike Moran, his writing partner at the time, and David Richards. It contained four singles, the title track, the Golden Boy, How Can I Go On, and Guide Me Home, which was released only in Japan as a single in January of 1989. In Europe, this album was a hit. Um, it basically, to Freddie Mercury, was, as I said, it was his passion project. It, it's, it was a, a, a collaboration, a crossover of sorts, bringing together the world of rock and the world of opera and just meshing them together and the, you know, hoping and wanting to see what would come out of it. And what came out of it was um, an opulent, over-the-top, grand, sophisticated piece of classical opera and adult contemporary pop music. Sorry, guys, only two coffees today, and I'm still screwing up. Um, the album, the original album, was recorded using uh, basically keyboards and computers. Every note on this album was meticulously put together. Every chord structure, everything. The Freddie Mercury, sorry, did not want any mistakes done on this album. He looked at this album as a passion project, as I said, and he was not going to let anything go to chance. He figured if he used computers and keyboards instead of a live orchestra, there would be no mistaking on the notes and the chord structures, etc. As of 2012, there has been a reissue of this album uh, released through Mercury Records, fittingly enough, um, and it was done using a live 40-piece orchestra featuring Roger Taylor's son, Rufus Tiger Taylor, on drums and percussion, okay? The only thing saved from the original recording was the vocals that were superbly sung by Freddie Mercury and La Signora Caballé. Uh, the album starts off with the title track, Barcelona. And the reason uh, for the origin of this track 
is that Freddie Mercury was asked to write a song for Barcelona, forgive me, uh, for the Summer Olympics of 1992 because the Olympics were going to be held in Barcelona. He agreed. Uh, Montserrat Caballé was asked to participate on the track, being from Spain, and she agreed. And it was actually Freddie Mercury made it well known in the press that he really wanted to work with uh, Montserrat Caballé because he had uh, seen her in performance with Luciano Pavarotti back in 1983 in London. She went out apparently and she bought all of the Queen catalog and listened to every album back to back and realized that they could possibly do something good together. So they met and she apparently it was just going to be one song, the title track, but she wanted to work on an entire album with him. So as he put it, not wanting to turn the super diva down, he and Mike Moran had to come up with some musical pieces. They came up with seven pieces. The eighth piece is a medley of the previous seven pieces that I will get into, uh, which ends off the album. The album again starts with Barcelona and it is very opulent, very over the top, very grand, very sophisticated. And it is very beautiful, very melodic. And it talks about the um, love for uh, the city of Barcelona. What I love about this song and about the rest of the album is Freddie Mercury and Mike Moran together had a very unique talent of of intertwining and inter uh, uh, I guess crossing of vocal lines and melody lines on piano or violin or whatever instrument they were using. They would um, basically intersect lines. So you would have a vocal line that was ascending and you would have a musical line that was descending and they would cross over quite well. He would do this with his own vocals he would do this with Montserrat Caballé's vocals on these tracks. Uh, Barcelona has a very, again, grand feel about it. He does the backing vocals on it. He does basically like a wall of backing vocals on the chorus. And it is beautiful. Um, next up is a track called La Japonese, which is an ode to the country of Japan. It is sung, the verses are sung in Japanese. He sings in Japanese and Montserrat Caballé sings in English. And it is done with uh, Japanese instrumentation. Again, very opulent, very grand, very over the top and very much Freddie Mercury. Okay. The third track, The Fallen Priest, started off as um, a track called Rachmaninoff's Revenge. It was since then turned into a tri uh, renamed the duet. Tim Rice, uh, you know, uh, worked with uh, worked on the musical chess, worked on the musical Jesus Christ Superstar with Andrew Lloyd Webber, was a friend of Freddie Mercury's, and he was given the track and he worked on the lyrics for the track, which eventually became the Fallen Priest, and he is basically about an individual who is questioning his faith in God and his dedication to the priesthood. And should he fall for this woman? Should he take a chance? And um, she's basically telling him, come with me. I'll give you everything you want in life. I'll give you love, acceptance, passion, an adventure. And it's left very ambiguous in the end as to what happens. The final track on side one called En Sueño started out as uh, basically an instrumental piece called Exercises in Free Love, which if you're a Freddie Mercury fan, you know that this was the B-side to the cover of the he did of The Great Pretender, which was released in 87. Upon meeting um, Montserrat Caballé in March, of 1987 at the Ritz Hotel in Spain. He gave her 
this piece of instrumental music, Exercises in Free Love. She loved the track. She put some vocals, uh, vocals, excuse me, lyrics to the track. It is sung in Spanish. It is beautiful. It is said that she wanted him to sing in his uh, baritone voice, natural speaking voice, instead of the falsetto. Because on the demo and the version that you hear on the B-side of uh, The Great Pretender, you hear him doing the female voice in the falsetto. Perfectly, actually. So um, it is a beautiful mix of baritone and soprano coming together beautifully, beautifully. Second side starts off with the track called The Golden Boy. And this is um, where all of Freddie's influences come together on one track. Um, my take of the track is um, about a gentleman who basically is always striving for the next best thing, who is always striving for perfection until he realizes that happiness does not come from outside, outside sources. They do help, but happiness, as much of a cliche as it is, as it sounds, I should say, happiness does come from within. And on the center section of the track, the gospel choir comes in. And this is where his love of Aretha Franklin comes in full force. Freddie Mercury loved opera. He loved gospel music. One of Freddie's um, inspirational albums that he listened to was Aretha Franklin's Amazing Grace, which was a uh, double album. I have the CD downstairs. And he would always go back to that album for, as he put it, loads of inspiration. And it is uh, clocks in at around six minutes and five seconds. It is over the top. It is opera. It is pop. It is gospel. And it is Freddie just wallowing in his influences and his passion of different types of music. Um, you can hear that he is having a fantastic time on this track. And the um, the gospel section that has been, I think it was done overdubbing or multi-tracking, I should say, about, uh, well, four people doing the main uh, gospel section, just multi-tracking their vocals, I don't know how many times. Uh, Queen would multi-track their vocals no more than, say, nine times per vocal line, per line of a song. So you can imagine how many vocal overdubs that he was able to do for this track. Coming up, track number um, six is a track called um, Guide Me Home, third single from the album. And it is basically Freddie coming to terms with the fact that he has been diagnosed with AIDS and he's basically resigning himself to the fact that eventually this will his fate will be death. The opening lyric on this track is now the wind has left my sail. And the following lyric is uh, now the scent has left my trail. Basically, he's being stripped of everything that he has known and everything that he has had before. And he is left with just him and his bare soul. And what will the future hold for him? He doesn't know. That track is just him and Montserrat Caballé com coming together on the vocal. And Mike Moran just on grand piano. It's a very simple track, very basic, very down to earth, very bare bones. And it is melodic. It is sentimental. It is heart-wrenching. It is beautiful. That segues into Guide Me Home, literally segues into Guide Me Home, which was the last single released from the album, only in Japan, however. This features John Deacon of Queen on bass. It is um, pop, uh, mid-tempo piece, very... Uh, very heart-wrenching. 
The lead, the lead off lyric is when all the salt is taken from the sea, I stand dethroned, I'm naked and I bleed. So he's basically saying to whoever is in front of him, I'm here, I'm pleading for you to help me. Will you be with me? Will you will you be there for me? And he's questioning whether or not he will be able to endure what is coming his way in terms of his life. He knows that mortality is basically staring him in the face. And he has to come to grips with the fact that eventually he will be gone. He's questioning whether or not he can do this. In the end, his resolve is strong and he does go on in one form or another. The last track is called Overture Picante. And it is his six minute, 40 second track. And what it is, is it's a medley of all the pieces prior from Barcelona up until How Can I Go On? done in a medley form. And I think that it encapsulates sorry, what the album is all about beautifully in six minutes and 40 seconds. Now, guys, that is the album. It's not very long. Again, it clocks in around 39 minutes, 56 seconds. The version I have is 40 seconds. What's four seconds here and there? For me, when I listened to this album, I didn't take to it right away because I was used to um, Freddie Mercury being with Queen and being, you know, over the top and the, you know, the rock side of what he did in terms of rock music. This is a step outside the box completely. It is an album that he has always wanted to make on his own. He obviously realized that he couldn't do this within the conf within the structure of Queen as a band. So he wanted to go out and do this on his own. And for me, he nails it. Okay. He knocks it out of the park. And according to Montserrat Caballé, it brought people from the rock world over to the opera world and vice versa. Okay. Again, it alienated some people. It endeared some people. Uh, Reinhold Mack has said that a uh, producer extraordinaire has said that he didn't think that the production overall worked because of the two uh uh, the two uh, musical genres coming together. You can't mix rock with opera. But you know what? Freddie Mercury, in the end, did not care. He did whatever the hell he wanted to do musically. And if you came along for the ride, great. If you didn't, so be it. So guys, please check out this album. It is available in your record shops. It's available on Amazon on Discogs, on eBay. It's well circulated. It's released through Mercury Records right now. It is not discontinued. Right now, you can get the Mercury Records reissue um, of the album from 2012. You can get it in a four-disc set on eBay. You can get it through Amazon, the regular uh, single-disc version. Please check it out. Let me know what you think. Put your comments down there, down below. And let me know what you think of the album. Do you like the album? Have you heard of the album? Do you not like the album? Do you think that the two musical genres of rock and opera should stay separate? Or could they coexist together and cross over? I mean, think of it this way. If Bruce Dickinson from Iron Maiden could do a duet with Montserrat Caballé, why not? Right? Why not Freddie Mercury? And I also... Re uh, I read about the album is that this album, the vocals were done separate because of their schedules. They could not always meet to record uh, together. So her parts were recorded 
separately. The, the tracks were sent to her and she added her parts in after, again, due to their busy, uh, busy schedules. So again, please check out the album and down there, down below, let me know what you think. And, well, you know, I mean, there's no right or wrong answers. I wanted to give you just a bit of a stretch in terms of musically what I listen to and what I like. Um, hopefully, you'll enjoy this video and you'll go check this out. You can stream it on YouTube or usually on uh, probably any other music streaming sites, but YouTube is probably the way, uh, the easier and cheaper way to do it. So again, let me know what you think. And uh, I will be doing a show with Peter Kent from the Lizard King channel on uh, top 10 Rolling Stones albums. I'm going to see if we can do that a bit earlier than the 16th, as I had mentioned before, but I'll wait and see what Peter's schedule is like. I will be doing a show with uh, Grant Arthur from Grant's Rock Warehouse on the Tea Party's fourth release, Triptych, from uh, 1999, released through EMI Canada. Uh, please check out both the Lizard King channel with Peter Kent and Grant's Rock Warehouse with Grant Arthur. They both have fantastic content. So once again, I'll leave you for now, and I'll be back soon with another video. Bye for now.